Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Brad Glick. I'm a dermatologist in South Florida, residency program director at the Larkin Palm Springs Hospital in Miami, Florida. I want to thank the DEF for inviting me to their annual meeting, DEF 2022. And I'm really pleased to speak to you today about urticaria and its impact on the skin. These are my disclosures. And I would also say that I'm here in my capacity as a board certified dermatologist practicing in Florida and also mentoring residents in the residency program. Here are our objectives. Our objectives are to review the clinical assessment of urticaria, its subtypes and disease activity, discuss the importance of treatment or avoidance of underlying causes and potentiating factors, uh, including cold and heat. And we'll talk a lot today about physical urticarias describe the guideline-driven therapies that are available for chronic urticaria, discuss the rationale and efficacy for omalizumab and other alternative therapies for chronic urticaria, and identify and apply evidence-based recommendations for the management of chronic uh, urticaria. What is urticaria? Well, it's common, it's a pink, dermal plaque. Patients will certainly complain of itching, burning. These are typical wheels that we see in our patients, and it's so variable how patients will present to our clinics. One or two wheels, multiple wheels, widespread wheels. They may or may not last longer than 24 hours, and we'll talk about in just a second what differentiates acute urticaria from chronic ones. Patients will frequently see new ones in completely different areas or they may occur in the same areas uh, frequently. Most patients with chronic urticaria other than those with obvious physical causes uh, will often uh, have what we know as uh, kind of ordinary urticaria. But chronic urticaria, as we will see, becomes very challenging because finding the cause most of the time is like a needle in a haystack. It's very difficult and that challenges our management as well. Although over the last eight to 10 years, it's great that we've had some new and innovative therapies available for us to be able to treat these patients. How do we classify urticaria? Well, acute versus chronic. You know, Most of the time we'll see someone, they've had some shellfish, uh, we see them in the clinic, they have a particular known exposure, it's happened within 24 or 48 hours, or they've had it, they've been managing it on their own, but it's less than the six week period, that's acute urticaria. Once we get beyond six weeks, it's becoming less likely to identify a particular trigger. And, and that six week cutoff is what identifies chronic urticaria by definition. Why does it happen? Infections, viral infections, hepatitis, mono, HIV, bacterial infections, mycoplasma, parasitic infections. We'll see that, we'll see that when we look at lab work, we'll see elevated eosinophils. Uh, connective tissue disorders, we'll get a little bit into that. Hyper eosinophilic syndrome, so those are rare, uncommon. Those patients will be sicker, they'll have internal organ involvement and cardiovascular issues. Hyperthyroidism, we'll see this uh, not infrequently in patients with Graves or people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We'll see some urticaria as it's presenting signs. I'll talk about in this conference, skin signs of systemic disease and clearly thyroid disorders uh, are manifest uh, sometimes frequently with urticaria. Malignancies may uh, occur and uh, present with uh, urticaria and lymphomas as well, especially. And so take that into consideration when you're managing an urticaria patient, particularly when they're, they're chronic. And speaking of viruses, uh, many of us saw a host of different presentations of urticaria during the pandemic. This is a very nice article uh, published uh, by a number of our colleagues uh, that reviewed not only various skin manifestations uh, of uh, COVID-19, but as well, uh, urticaria, as you see here in this very nice slide in this graphic here. And I pointed this out just primarily to remind you that particularly since we are still in the midst of a pandemic, when you see unexplained uh, urticaria, you should certainly consider COVID-19, uh, considering some of the other background consequences. And we see here the many other uh, presenting consequences of uh, COVID-19 infections as it relates to skin, including the so-called COVID toes, pseudo chill blain, uh, patients presenting with varicella-like infections, petechiae, perfora, perfora. I've had a couple of different cases during the early part of the pandemic uh, where individuals presented with erythema multiforme-like rashes. So again, you know, urticaria is potentially, 
potential consideration uh, uh, as a presenting sign for COVID-19. Um, spontaneous urticaria happening after the COVID-19 vaccine. I can tell you and share with you that I uh, developed a papillary eruption after my third booster. Uh, this is an article published just uh, within the, the first year uh, of the pandemic by um, our leader in the COVID-19 cutaneous manifestations and the COVID-19 task force, Esther Freeman, um, and actually with one of my students, Roanne Now Lee, a uh, very nice article just to reaffirming some of the cutaneous reactions that we see following the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, once again, nowadays you're gonna ask the patients when they present with urticaria, did you have a vaccine recently? Were you recently ill? Did you have a viral infection? Including, but not limited to COVID-19. And this is from the post-COVID centers, just. Again, rashes may occur in the setting of COVID-19, uh, also after vaccines as well. And, and, and we've seen urticaria uh, in a chronic fashion as part of long haul, uh, long haulers with COVID-19. And so again, patients that are coming into your practice with uh, smoldering urticaria, you may want to consider the possibility uh, of COVID-19. Uh, exogenous etiologies, of course, medications are always a possibility. Uh, when we're counseling uh, our patients and we're talking to patients with our residents, we're always reminding to take a very good drug history. Preservatives and various creams, including our prescription creams, even corticosteroids. Uh, we have a whole host of new uh, topical therapies that are coming to market uh, with uh, that are non-steroidals. And so therefore we have to take these in consideration foods um, various arthropod bites, uh, inhalants of any kind, uh, pollens, uh, insect venoms, and animal dan dander. Of course, uh, pets out there are so popular, uh, particularly our fe feline species and animal dander is not an uncommon cause for urticaria. So we have to ask a lot of questions. And don't forget over-the-counter etiologies, of course. Acetaminophen and ibuprofen are two very common causes of urticaria, as are aspirin. You know, someone who's a new aspirin taker, perhaps their doctor, despite the new guidelines uh, with a cutoff at around the age of 60, uh, above 60, yes, aspirin's okay. Below 60, you probably don't need it, although I'm sure that'll change in about a year, but nevertheless, aspirin, not an uncommon cause of urticaria. So make sure to ask what over-the-counter uh, uh, non-prescription medications are being taken by the patient, including vitamins. You just never know, and it may not be the vitamin. It may be what's surrounding the vitamin or some of the preserves associated with uh, that particular vitamin. Signs and symptoms of urticaria are caused by mast cell degranulation. All of you know this, the release of histamine. But what does it do? Well, it increases capillary fragility. It increases capillary permeability. This leaks to this transient leakage a fluid that we see as these kind of swollen areas with erythema. It's a very dermal process, it looks very fluid filled, and that's exactly what a wheel is. Uh, what are the main types of urticaria? Uh, cold urticaria, solar urticaria, so sun induced urticaria. We would see this not uncommonly in Florida. Um, heat, cholinergic urticaria, dermatographism, delayed pressure urticaria, hypersensitivity reactions that present uh, as urticaria autoimmune phenomenon, take into consideration the possibility of a background connective tissue disease or someone with known connective tissue disease certainly is not exempt from the development of urticaria, of various pharmacological exposures. And again, contact urticaria is a whole uh, dialogue and conversation in and of itself. Let's get into different types of urticarias. Cold urticaria, simple. Uh, we know about the ice cube test, which is a very common way that we can actually prove cold urticaria, but patients will develop wheels when they're just getting into the cold. They get out of an airplane, uh, they walk out into the street, they're waiting for their, car their cab and they're, they're, they're breaking out in hives or, or they're waiting for their Uber or their Lyft. Sorry, I, I have to be more modern day and not so old fashioned. Um, a useful test is the ice cube test. Uh, we put it in a plastic bag, we sit it on the, the, the skin uh, for really, in some cases, a matter of seconds, but within the first 30 to 60 uh, seconds, uh, we will see individuals develop uh, a hive at that site. And sometimes in cases in individuals that are cold sensitive, uh, we may see it uh, in uh, additional areas as well, but typically at the site of application. And that's your, that's your positive test. A few cases of uh, cold urticaria associated with cold um, 
agglutinins or cold cryofibrinogens and take that into consideration. And when you're working up a patient with chronic urticaria, there may be some considerations, particularly if there appears to be that cold component that you're suspicious for, uh, uh, check their cold agglutinins and their uh, cryofibrinogen. Solar urticaria, these are wheels that occur within minutes of sun exposure. And most of these patients will have an actually uh, uh, IgE-mediated urticarial reaction. To the sunlight. And so these are patients where I will certainly check an IgE uh, e level um, uh, accordingly. And some patients with uh, solar urticaria take this into consideration, particularly when they are very facially photosensitive. They almost look like they have a malar rash uh, of uh, lupus. These are individuals with urticaria that may be uh, having underlying erythropoietic protoporphyria. Other physical urticaria, as we alluded to before, heat urticaria, uh, in this condition, we see the wheels that are arising in, in, with exposure to heat. Again, we we'll sometimes will we'll hear patients that end up in the emergency room coming from a cooler environment. They end up going out to a place like Arizona or Vegas, uh, specifically Vegas, where it's super dry uh, uh, and, and uh, very, very hot. Um, cholinergic urticaria elicited by anxiety, also heat once again, strenuous exercise. Uh, this is from activation of acetylcholine in the sympathetic nerves. Um, in physical urticaria, we tend to see smaller wheels. They tend to hug the follicle, a little bit different. And then there's from water exposure, aquagenic urticaria, which is uh, precipitated by contact with water. And that's irrespective of temperature. It could be warm water. Uh, we'll see these patients develop these kind of white-like plaques, particularly on the palms. And the, and the hives themselves will look a little bit different. They'll look a little bit more white. They'll look a little bit less red. And certainly they are infiltrative appearing. And this is just an example of some physical urticaries. This is an individual who went out for a run and they developed these almost agamated like discrete and somewhat coalescent, very small, as we said before, uh, and these types of, of hives like cholinergic urticaria, the hives tend to be a little bit smaller. A dermatographism, um, the uh, most common type of physical urticaria. I'll share with this, she probably won't be happy, but my daughter has dermatographism and she's actually a dermatology PA. This is very challenging. She has to be on chronic antihistamine therapy. Um, so it's very challenging to treat this as we all know. Uh, we all like to test for this in the office by doing a gentle stroking, usually I, on the patient's back. I have a kid with them and we, we tell them we're gonna play some tic-tac-toe by drawing a tic-tac a toe on their back, and then we'll be able to discover for them simply that they have dermatographism, and we'll show them a nice picture from the iPad. Again, mast cell degranulation leading to the release of histamine. We'll see linear wheels. Patients will come in complaining, my goodness, my skin might feel a little sensitive. It may feel dry. I go to scratch it, uh, and I, I'm able to raise a hive, a wheel, and it's linear. And we know that this is representing an exaggerated triple response of Lewis. Um, urticarial reactions are also produced by simply uh, scratching any area. I will do this with a, a blunt uh, object, as I said before in, in the clinic. The late pressure urticaria is a sustained pressure that causes edema of the skin uh, with uh, an inflammatory reaction that will occur uh, within a matter of hours. It can last up to 48 hours. So it's a little bit different presentation of urticaria. Less likely is to be, but more likely it's a bradykinin or a kinin uh, initiating process or from prostaglandins as the likely mediators. And an example of this is uh, we'll see it in patients who uh, are often uh, developing some swelling of their feet. It'll take on an edematous hue, have an index of suspicion of this. It may look red, it may not look red. Uh, sometimes individuals who have delayed pressure urticaria will be rubbing their hands a lot. Um, we'll see this after people that are, uh, even who have uh, underlying atopic dermatitis and they're rubbing their hands um, um, or kind of smacking them together when they're putting on their moisturizers. Uh, those individuals, whoever are kind of hard sitters, and they'll, they'll kind of uh, slap down onto a chair. Uh, we'll see this in individuals uh, who have pressure uh, or delayed pressure urticaria. Why does it happen? And, and who's, who's it, who is it um, affecting? And it, it's not common. It affects about 20% of the population. It occurs across all age spectrums. Doesn't really select out male or female. Uh, so it is clearly equigender, sometimes possible to avoid, uh, identify a trigger. But a lot of the times we'll see these patients back. We've asked them to keep a diary. Uh, they're not able to really find a source. 
foods, drugs, insect bite, infections, as we talked about before. Uh, and about two thirds of the cases, thankfully, are self-limiting and that's in that acute urticaria uh, setting. Um, definitely pyritic. Uh, Moch itch receptors are active at nighttime and I'll warn my patients that their itching is gonna be worse at night. Uh, wheels, erythematous plaques, they'll often look blanchy. They'll be surrounded by a blanch, oval, round, irregular uh, shapes or possibles, but they'll be edematous. And they're migratory. You know, the patients will say, I woke up and they're in this particular area. I took some Benadryl. I wake up the next morning and they're in completely different places, uh, often lasting, um, particularly when it's acute and intermittent and, and less than six weeks of age, we'll see it lasting uh, much less than 24 hours. And it doesn't leave any marks. It doesn't scar. Here's some nice clinical photos of her to carry those deep edematous wheels, a little bit of surrounding erythema. Sometimes they do look pink themselves. We see them taking on that white hue right here. Uh, urticaria to the left. And some of these patients will present with urticaria and angioedema. Hopefully in these cases, we're able to find a source uh, uh, such as a drug and you can see the seriousness of angi angioedema. And clearly these patients, we have to ask them if they're having respiratory symptoms. It can be quite concerning. Here's another gentleman uh, with uh, urticaria and associated um, uh, angioedema, perhaps um, a, a milder case. Uh, again, uh, affects men and women equally. Here's a man with uh, urticaria, pretty widespread. Uh, also a woman who has uh, pretty much primarily uh, angioedema and has had it on and off for many years. Would have not explained cause. Uh, young children, older patients. Here's a lady with urticaria, but she really has this kind of surrounding periocular edema. So you just have to have an index of suspicion. And in these last series of clinical pictures, you can see the differences uh, that uh, clinical presentations take on. Urticaria and pregnancy. Now remember, urticaria of pregnancy, urticaria during pregnancy. Uh, there are some differences there too. We can see it in uh, pregnant women. We can see it in women that are breastfeeding. Buyer beware, there are some limitations in the use uh, of antihistamines, and we certainly don't want to be using uh, early generation antihistamines like Benadryl. It's not recommended by most uh, obstetricians, but we are safe to use loratadine and uh, cetirizine as two examples. And it's preferential to be using these a little bit later on in pregnancy. Early on in pregnancy, it becomes a challenge. And of course, before you do anything, you're going to have a conversation uh, with the pregnant individual's uh, obstetrician. How do we treat urticaria? And that's really one of the big reasons why we're here. And, you know, there's really not been a lot in the last 20 years. Our go-tos are the H1 antihistamines, uh, certainly a non-pregnant individual, first generations are diphenhydramine, chlorpheramine, and even hydroxazine. I use a lot of hydroxazine. It works very well. Uh, it's obviously very sedating, as is Benadryl and chlorpheramine. And we'll tend to have these patients using them nocturnally uh, with a non-sedating uh, H1 blocker during the day. And you see the second generation H1 blockers and cetirizine, loratadine, fexofenadine, and we're leaving out levocetirizine here in the somewhat older slide, uh, and um, desloratadine. And we'll talk a little bit about at least one of those agents. Um, you know, 20, 30 minutes, not a lot of time to talk about every single therapy. Um, also in the background, if you have severe urticaria, kind of protecting the GI tract. And also remember there's an antihistaminic effect of the H2 blockers that will provide some itch relief. So ranitidine, uh, uh, nizetidine, famotidine, cimetidine um, are all potential agents. Um, cimetidine is not used very often, very mu uh, much for much of anything. Actually, for me, I use it in high doses in the management of uh, warts. Let's talk a little bit about one of these agents, desloratadine, uh, active and potent metabolite of loratadine. Um, you'll know that as an over-the-counter uh, product known as Claritin, uh, uh, say second generation uh, H1 receptor antagonist, clinical pharmacology, as we see with loratadine as well, but this is a kind of a higher second generation long-acting tricyclic antihistamine, selective H1 antihistamine receptor blocker with potent uh, antagonistic activity. Um, uh, there were some studies that were done, guinea pigs showing that uh, desloratadine did not readily cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's why there's a very low rate in that three to 6% of sedation. But I do have some patients call me and tell me sometimes that they feel a little drowsy from this. My experience with desloratadine is that it has been highly effective and um, uh, very much non-sedating, works as early as about an hour. The effects 
uh, last for about 24 hours. It's dosed five milligrams uh, once daily. Um, Tmax, three hours, neither food or grape juice have particular effect on its bioavailability and about 82 to 87% bind to plasma protein has a, a 20 seven hour uh, elimination half-life. And so uh, th this is why we can see it lasting for as long as uh, 24 hours. And in terms of its actual elimination, uh, it's through, uh, through urine and feces in terms of the metabolic products. Uh, where is it indicated besides urticaria, allergic rhinitis, uh, relief of nasal and uh, non-nasal symptoms in individuals two years of age or older. And you see some of the other indications for perennial allergic rhinitis. Um, Older slide here, you know, we now know that chronic urticaria is known as chronic spontaneous uh, urticaria, very much the same because of its idiopathic nature um, a significant amount of the time. But as we know, it's not always idiopathic and we have to take it upon ourselves to be quite inquisitive and kind of unleash particular triggers uh, for these patients. And it does reduce the number of hives, the size of the hives uh, and um, in uh, individuals uh, down to an urticaria uh, six months of age or older. And as you know, Desiloratidine is over the counter now as well. Um, FDA approved over the age of six months now, uh, no CNS suppression really, as we talked about that study done in guinea pigs. Um, uh, limited penetration really doesn't have anticholinergic uh, side effects that we'll see with hydroxyzine uh, and uh, diphenhydramine um, uh, or over-the-counter Benadryl. Uh, it's an active and potent metabolite of loratitine, so remember that um, we've gone over some of this uh, material. And again, because uh, it is once a day, really good compliance with these once a day uh, antihistamines. Let's do a little case. This is a 33-year-old white female presents with a five-month history of hives, swelling, She's um, seen a primary care, placed on diphenhydramine, very common. It's how we see our patients. Her hives improve slightly on this regimen, but she still has daily episodes. The hives come and go, common with our urticaria patients. They come and go throughout the, the day, but they're made worse by when taking a hot bath. Uh, the hives come and go, um, as I said, she now presents the possibility, uh, you know, what, what's causing this doc? And so based on her history, um, she most likely has uh, which type of urticaria is acute allergic urticaria, chronic idiopathic urticaria, cholinergic urticaria, or urticario vasculitis. Well, clearly with it being over uh, six weeks, uh, it's a, a form of chronic urticaria. And the question is which type, um, uh, subtype, and are we going to be able to find a trigger? So correctly here, it's chronic urticaria, which is choice B. Um, repeated occurrences, short-lived uh, cutaneous wheels accompanied by redness, uh, itching, um, just in general, we know that these are hives, just kind of a little bit of uh, repetition here, reminding you the differences between the different presentations of hive. Individual wheels uh, will typically last less than uh, 24 hours, particularly in those individuals with acute urticaria. But in general, even individuals who have chronic urticaria, their hives may be very transient, but it's frustrating because it continues for longer periods of time. Um, what about the progression? Just looking at stepping away from uh, urticaria, looking for a trigger, looking for a cause, mast cell degranulation, uh, chronic inflammation leading to those urticarial symptoms. And just, you know, you can never see enough clinical pictures of urticaria and the presentations will vary. Um, you know, again, Digging into chronic urticaria as we start to talk about therapy, you know, we know acute's a little easier. We can more commonly find the source. We'll put them on antihistamines. We sometimes have to give them systemic steroids. Once that exposure is removed, those individuals tend to do better. But here we have our chronic urticaria patients. They're now in your office. It's been going on for a couple months. It may last months to years. These patients are really frustrated. And the cause is often not found. It's IgE mediated. And as I said before, we saw some clinical photos, these individuals may have concurrent angioedema. And again, when it's more acute, you know, we have to really watch that respiratory pattern. Sometimes when accompanied by urticaria, that angioedema in and of itself is chronic. And it's more frustrated. And those patients are not necessarily uh, expressing significant respiratory symptoms. Their eyes are swollen, their lips are swollen, their face is swollen, but they're able to breathe just fine. But track that very carefully. And if there is an associated respiratory compromise, as long as it's not severely acute, sometimes I'll involve my allergy and or pulmonary uh, partners. So uh, chronic urticaria, smaller percentage of the population, really not a clear identifying prevalence in the United States. We'll tend to see it a little bit later on. Um, um, 
and um, you know, in, in the in the in the in the, the Middle Ages, in terms of age, but not a uh, 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 thousand A.D., so to speak, more common in females. And so, when we think about urticaria overall, and we say it affects all you know types, ages, and what have you, when we start to hone in on chronic urticaria, we do tend to see a little bit more of a female predominance, and we really don't necessarily know why that is. Uh, pro pro prolonged durations, and so greater than a year that it's occurring at about 70% of individuals, those suffering about one to five years, about 9%, uh, greater than five years, uh, about 11 to 14%. Uh, this is a really nice graph here. So when we look at acute and chronic urticaria, separating this, and of course, when you're taking your boards, it's nice to know some of these separating factors. So urticaria lesions in both. Associated angioedema is, a, is not uncommon in both. Uh, in the acute urticaria setting, I will remind you that just really be careful to hone in and ask those questions about potential respiratory compromise. And they may not have it in the office, but they, they may have had it uh, at other times within that six week period. Uh, identifying uh, uh, an etiology more common with, it, with a, uh, acute, usually don't find it in, in, in chronic urticaria. Um, uh, other symptoms, uh, IgE mediated allergies, more so with acute urticaria, uh, less so with chronic urticaria, although it is IgE mediated. Um, you know, consider the disease because acute urticaria is acute, it's hopefully short lived for most patients, really not a disease, but more of a phenomenon. And you can find that trigger potential for anaphylaxis. Again, thankfully, more acute. And if we can find the source, uh, we can take away that trigger and get those patients much better. Now, we won't talk a lot about autoantibodies, not so much about urticarially associated connective tissue disease, uh, but urticarial vasculitis is an immune complex phenomenon, and uh, that is a disease and a discussion in and of itself. But bear in mind, those individuals who uh, have an index of suspicion when you're thinking about urticarial vasculitis, you want to do a biopsy, do a biopsy with immunofluorescence, and they are very difficult to find any kind of trigger there. But if it's happening from a reactive uh, a pattern uh, that is dictated by immune complexes. The chronic urticaria presentation, just in how it presents, uh, about 10% of the time, it's just angioedema. More than half the time, it's urticaria. And that remaining 40% about there is uh, uh, both entities presenting at one time. Um, Historically, the onset, the timing, the frequency, the dependence of the symptoms, how they arise, these are all very important questions. What are the precipitating factors? Most specifically important in the setting of acute urticaria, uh, but chronic urticaria, still have to ask questions when we see these patients. We may hone in on something and unleash a particular discovery and, and talk about what they do, where they work, what their exposures are. Very important. It's tricky. It's very tricky. And don't forget those over-the-counter exposures. So let's talk about our case. Let's get back to this case. So you take a detailed history from our patient. You find that she has hives throughout the day and night. Ugh, suffering. She has no fevers, no night sweats, no no cough, she's not losing weight, she's not congested, she's not short of breath. So this is not one of those individuals that has that concurrent angioedema component. Um, she's fatigued um, and, and it lasts most of the day. And so this is really making her tired. Uh, her menstrual cycle is normal and it really hasn't waxed the wane at all uh, with uh, her hives. Now remember, not to get off topic, but there is a progesterone dermatitis, there's a progestin or progesterone dermatitis. We sometimes see this with the birth control pill and those patients can present with hives. Um, uh, based on this new information, what history would be uh, most appropriate for us to obtain uh, now? And, and now this is a challenging question. Um, you know, is it aeroallergens? Is it a new detergent? Is it an exposure to food? Uh, is it medicines that she's taking? You know, we've probably ruled out the medication history al already. It really could be any of these. And I think these questions uh, are particularly important, really all of them, um, both in the setting of acute and even common uh, chronic urticaria uh, along the way as well. Now, it turns out that what ends up happening uh, in general, you, you're, you're looking for uh, patients if they have background uh, angioedema, edema, that sometimes may make you hone, on, hone in on a particular exposure could even be a medication. And once again, I've had some cases of chronic urticaria where the patients have come to me and you think like, my God, we're not gonna find a cause here. And lo and behold, even though you asked the question about, uh, are you taking Advil? 
uh, and it turns out they are taking another non-steroidal. They might be taking uh, naproxen uh, over the counter. There's different forms. And so just make sure we're being very, very careful about what the patients are taking, what their exposures are, what their intolerances are. Is there a family history of atopy? Now remember, in not an insignificant number of patients, there is background ATP in about 25, 30% of these patients who are presenting with a smoldering, smoldering urticaria. You may have two disease states in the background that need management. And of course, nowadays with new biologic therapies, like an inch, for instance, through bilumab, we may be able to manage both presentations. Um, there's certainly impairment of quality of life and um, you know, depending on their treatments uh, previously uh, will dictate how you approach uh, uh, your patient. And so uh, the patient in this particular case, Sage, she does not have any particular allergies. Uh, dust and cats do make her sneeze. Um, you know, and maybe in that question that we saw, uh, it is possible that the best answer, although it could be any of those, uh, might be that there's some environmental allergen. Maybe there's cat dander that someone is exposed to, and lo and behold, uh, hopefully the individual doesn't have the cat because we don't want to get rid of the cat, right? Uh, that would require then desensitization of therapy, which is very difficult. When she drinks wine, she thinks her hives get worse. Obviously, we know that's a vasodilatory exposure. Uh, she's not switched to detergent recently. Her current medications are simply a multivitamin and Tylenol. Ding, ding, ding. There's the Tylenol, but she takes it occasionally for headaches. Again, always important to ask those questions. Um, on physical examination, we see uh, normal vital signs. So she's well, her exams are unremarkable. She's got a lot of hives, about 50. There are blanchable hives upon pressure. And she does have a little bit of mild angioedema now, but for eyelids. So what do you do right now? Uh, do you do a skin biopsy? Well, you know, right now, clinically, it kind of looks and feels and you know, seems like she has hives. We don't have a picture of it, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, our lab work is lab work going to help her? Does she need an ANA? Does she seem like she has connective tissue disease? You know, allergy skin testing at this point uh, may be a very, very helpful for her. And, and that's most likely there. And some of these questions, you know, there's not a definitive answer. And that's really not so much the importance here about passing a test. It's about having the conversation and asking the right questions. So in terms of physical examination, uh, lesions of urticarial, typically edematous, pink, red wheels. But as you saw in some of the pictures, because they're so infiltrative, they'll blanch that erythema and they'll take on kind of a whitish hue when they're raised, those deep wheels that we've seen pictures of. Pain, burning, dysesthesia uh, uh, may happen in these wheels. And when they do feel uh, uh, burning, these patients, they do feel dysesthesias. Uh, almost numbness and tingling in the areas have an index of suspicion for associated urticarial vasculitis. Uh, now, these lesions may fade within 24 to 48 hours, as I mentioned before, uh, but vasculitic type, urticarial vasculitis, they are more infiltrative, they're less migratory, and they uh, may last for days or sometimes even weeks. And with urticarial vasculitis, we'll sometimes see a little bit more post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation because when true hives disappear, and you'll look at that window on the left here, that's a typical infiltrative, more of that white urticaria with peripheral erythema, where the other pictures are more typical of those more deep-seated wheels. And some of these look annular at times. There's that blanching effect because of the edema in the center. They almost look like targetoid lesions that we see in erythema multiforming. Let's talk a little bit about guidelines, routine evaluations. Testing should be very selective. You've got to look at each individual um, in that manner. Uh, each situation may be a little bit different. Um, now, the, the majority of the members of the Practice Parameters Task Force uh, for chronic spontaneous urticaria and chronic idiopathic urticaria uh, recommends some basic testing at baseline, CBC, SED rate, um, uh, liver enzymes, thyroid stimulating hormone. Just for me personally, this is Brad Glick speaking, I don't order a lot of CRPs and ESRs when they're high. It's maybe helpful, but it's fine, very nonspecific. Uh, checking thyroid studies, I think is important. Uh, sometimes patients will be picked up uh, as having undiagnosed thyroid disease and there's your etiology for your urticaria. And of course, treating the thyroid disease doesn't necessarily guarantee resolution of the hives and they do require standard treatment. Uh, you know, and, and the utility of, of performing these particular tests hasn't uh, specifically been established. Um, and and so, so, you know, there's European guidelines, there's American guidelines. Um, this is from the European uh, allergy and immunology, clinical immunology guidelines. 
um, just in terms of routine tests, we talked about this, um, uh, trying to avoid particular triggers like NSAIDs. NSAIDs are really a, a kind of a very big deal. Uh, there are certain infectious disease, and, and uh, we talked categorically before about exposures, um, uh, testing these individuals for thyroid disease, I just alluded to, looking for physical urticaria, allergens, pseudoallergens, autologous skin tests uh, may be uh, performed. I think the lesional skin biopsy is really only necessary when you're considering urticarial uh, vasculitis. Pseudoallergens, what the heck are pseudoallergens? Well, they're substances that induce intolerance reactions. So this could be food add, uh, uh, additives, uh, vasoactive substances, fruit. Some people have sensitivities to fruit, uh, like strawberries, very, uh, vegetables, like sensitivity to tomatoes. You know, people come in and they'll say, well, I eat tomatoes and I break out in hives. And what I tell them is, uh, don't eat tomatoes. Um, various spices, cinnamon, a uh, very common cause of local uh, almost a contact type urticaria, but even systemic urticaria. Uh, if it's foods, it usually occur early on, days ones to seven, um, uh, other particular type of food exposures a little bit later on, and um, you know, days uh, 11 to 31, um, uh, you know, pseudo allergens uh, in, in general. Um, here are some um, response rates that we see here uh, where individuals uh, had, in terms of uh, their uh, pseudo allergen, um, free diet, if you will, is, is what this graph is showing here. And um, you know, when you, when you withdraw this, as you see to the left here, and then to the right, how these individuals did, um, nevertheless, uh, about 16% deteriorated, about 50% uh, were neutral, and about 34% benefited. So you know, nevertheless, um, uh, whether or not this reduction of exposure type of diet will help uh, is to be questioned, but nevertheless, our allergy partners are exceptional uh, at uh, utilizing these, and sometimes they are helpful. Uh, the patient's complete uh, blood count, uh, which if you look back at that test question, uh, probably that was the answer that they were looking for, uh, but um, you know, nevertheless, all of those particular forms of testing and allergy testing is very helpful. We talked about pseudoallergen withdrawal, but now we have an individual here who has a slightly elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's about 30, normally is up to 20, and um, her liver functions are okay, and her thyroid panel is final too. So, so you know, what do you do now? What's the next best step in, in management? Is it diphenhydramine, 50 milligrams four times a day? You know, I really don't think so. I don't think that that's a good idea. That's highly sedating. Discontinue. Prior use of diphenhydramine, um, switch to cetirizine, 10 milligrams twice daily, cimetidine, said that's an older drug. Dapsone really is indicated for chronic uh, spontaneous urticaria, but we're going to use that down the road uh, with more severe cases and when we've tried some other things. And so utilizing cetirizine makes sense here, or even a product like levocetirizine. Uh, 10 milligrams once daily is the standard uh, recommended dosing regimen, but uh, our allergy partners have really been very gifted to recommend to their patients and their anecdotal reports. And there are some clinical studies uh, that indicate that dosing regimens that are up to 40 milligrams total daily dose uh, will help many of these patients. H1 antihistamines are really the mainstay for managing urticaria. Their preferred first line therapy for urticaria or urticaria associated angioedema. Edema. Uh, they've been used uh, for, for multiple decades. Um, the first generations are associated with some risk of sedation and cholinergic effect, as we talked about with drugs like diphenhydramine, chlorpheniramine, uh, and hydroxyzine. And therefore, these really have been a godsend for us in managing our patients. In the clinical sense, they're, they're not always necessarily so immediately effective, but I do find the most important thing with urticaria patients is for patients to realize that they need to stay on drug and they need to stay on it with a continuum and really, especially in the beginning, not be so rambunctious about taking drug holidays. Uh, and second generation uh, agents have also been efficacious. And I think in, the, in the, the clinical trenches where all of us do work, uh, they have been quite helpful uh, for our patients. And I think they offer up uh, more significant benefits uh, than even the originator uh, histamine second generation blocker. So uh, continuing the case, after about three weeks, the patient returns to you and states that uh, after discontinuation of diphenhydramine, she is more alert, uh, she's less tired, but the cetirizine uh, did not appear to be that much better for managing her eyes. So 
Uh, I mentioned this, and then remember this, uh, this clinician decided to not even go with 10 milligrams once daily in the standard dose. Uh, they 20 milligrams total a daily dose and divided doses, 10 milligrams BID, and it wasn't that helpful. So what do you do now? Do you add hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, colchicine? Now, now B, C, and D here, I mean, those are drugs that certainly are used in the setting of urticaria. We usually use them further down the road when standard care uh, is not helping. And, and most of our allergy partners and those of us in dermatology, and there's been great articles published a very long time ago uh, by uh, Nick Soder and, and colleagues who are really mast cell experts. And, and really what they, they found that by escalating the dose, and it is off-label, but escalating the dose of cetirizine uh, to four times daily. So divided doses actually, instead of taking two at one time, that's 10 milligrams four times a day. It's quite effective in management of these patients with chronic urticaria. So what are the steps? What is the management program? What's the algorithm? Step one, avoid the triggers. We know this uh, in general. Uh, trying to avoid triggers a little bit more difficult in chronic urticaria. Monotherapy with a second generation antihistamine is kind of new thinking. Uh, uh, dose advancement, dose escalation will be step two, or even another second generation uh, uh, antihistamine. So maybe going from uh, loratadine to desloratadine or from cetirizine to levocetirizine. Remember the dosing regimen uh, for both of those agents for desiratine is five milligrams once daily. Levocetirazine is also five milligrams once daily. Uh, Adalucotriene receptor antagonists, we haven't talked uh, um, uh, a lot about those particular agents, but nevertheless, adding a leukotriene receptor antagonist is sometimes helpful, and, and, and I will do them uh, uh, with some frequency. Um, dose advancements, we've talked about. Um, uh, sometimes even with the older generation uh, therapies may be necessary. And we haven't talked about the, you know, the multi-factor agent of, of doxepin, very helpful agent, but a sedating agent. Remember, it will give a degree of a little stomach protection. It is an antidepressant and highly effective treating paritis associated with urticaria. Uh, and then finally, step four, potent anti-inflammatory agents. We sometimes have to jump into immunosuppressive therapies like cyclosporin and certainly biologics. We'll talk a little bit about this uh, as we close here. Combining antihistamines, H1s with H2, there's evidence uh, that's difficult to interpret. It's low level of, of evidence uh, uh, as opposed to some of the monotherapy studies that we know in terms of, uh, of the guidelines for individuals being managed with uh, urticaria. Uh, small numbers of patients, small numbers of studies, uh, different H1 antihistamines are used. The doses of H2 antihistamines um, have been variable and they're usually higher doses and than some of the earlier studies were with cimetidine. And when you start getting above 800 milligrams of cimetidine, even though it's an H2 blocker, we do get some crossing of the blood brain barrier and those patients will experience some sedation. And I can tell you in treating warts with higher doses uh, of cimetidine, even in the kiddos, obviously that's very much off label. Uh, we do have some parents calling and saying that there is some somnolence uh, with these patients. Um, we do see some superior efficacy in combining H1 and H2 blockers in a couple of clinical studies that are pretty old, but nevertheless very helpful information uh, that we see there listed. Um, and then there are some studies that have demonstrated no advantage. There are studies that have shown some drug-drug interactions in trying these combinations. And again, these are older combinations, but I think all of us uh, that, are, that are listening here uh, use uh, uh, plenty of hydroxyzine these days, and it does help a lot of our patients, particularly when their paritis is so severe in the evening. Now, I mentioned the uh, anti-leukotriene, the, uh, the leukotriene receptor uh, antagonist, uh, I'm on teleclast, and, and here are some of the other ones. Um, uh, there is substantial safety with these agents. They are essentially non-sedating. Um, there's been some randomized clinical trials. There have been some that have been favorable, some that have been not showing any particular advantage. But when you're getting into challenges, you've used your H1s, you combine your newer generation uh, uh, H1s with an H2 perhaps. Um, there is some uh, data to suggest that individuals where you've discovered some uh, aspirin exacerbated urticaria or angioedema that does not improve its chronic even upon withdrawal uh, of uh, the therapy, uh, that particular uh, agent, that exposure, that uh, this is a nice place for leukotriene antagonists. Uh, physical urticarias, it may be helpful, or if individuals have a positive autologous serum skin test. Um, you know, dose advancements of second generation uh, antihistamines 
uh, have been studied. And so uh, here we have this very nice study that was published uh, quite some time ago, uh, but nevertheless, very strong uh, data to suggest that we can escalate the doses, uh, not only of, of drugs like cetirizine, which we just talked about, but uh, drugs like levocetirizine and desloratadine, as I alluded to. And so for uh, drugs like levocetirizine, you can go up to doses. Again, typically it is four times the standard dose. And so with levocetirizine, it's going to be 20 milligrams. With desloratadine, it's going to be 20 milligrams. Remember, we said 40 milligrams for cetirizine. Um, uh, nevertheless, you know, be careful. Let your patients know that these are uh, uh, off-label uses, and they haven't, uh, but they haven't studied. But if you look at this particular study, while the impact that we see in terms of improvement of overall severity is good, uh, remember this is a small um, a study, and uh, you know, 40 pages, not a lot. Uh, uh, just additional data on uh, second generation antihistamine uh, dose uh, escalation, and this is for levocetirizine and desloratadine. Once again, uh, same study that I just referenced. Again, if it's safe, but switching does result uh, in a number of uh, symptom-free uh, periods and also symptom-free patients, as we see here. What about looking at doxepin versus diphenhydramine? Just kind of going through some studies here. Uh, both of these drugs are sedating. I can tell you, uh, I don't use a lot of doxepin uh, during the day, even at 10 milligrams TID. My patients will uh, report a lot of sedation. Same goes for Benadryl, uh, diphenhydramine, but, but you have to at times. Um, you see the differences between responses to therapy. This is a very study, a very, a very nice study that was done uh, quite a long time ago by Green and, and, and colleagues and looking at total or partial control of itching and uh, urticaria, uh, total clearing of uh, itching and urticaria and individuals treated with doxepin uh, were statistically superior in terms of their responses to, to uh, their improvement of their urticaria and their associated pruritus with doses of doxepin, 10 milligrams uh, TID. And so take that into consideration. It's an old study, but I can tell you, I pull this out of my toolbox uh, very, very frequently and uh, patients do quite well. Uh, I will tell you that I use a little bit of a different dosing regimen. I tend to use uh, my antihistamines more at HS, uh, but nevertheless, these were head-to-head -head monotherapy studies and not combination type studies. Uh, from a practical standpoint, using the non-sedators during the day and the more sedating antihistamines in the evening is really what makes more sense. Uh, the patient returns uh, three weeks later. Remember, this is our 33-year-old and, and states that after increasing her cetiridine to four times a day, she is only slightly better. The hives are very problematic for her and they're embarrassing. The most appropriate next step in therapy would be which of the following. Now, all of these are potential therapies uh, for or to carry out, although uncommonly used mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide, uh, lots of side effects there. Cyclosporin has been used quite commonly in, in the setting of our urticaria. And of course, we have our over 10 years of approval of omelizumab, uh, which is an IgE blocker, as you well know. And really, it's C and D would be the most modern day um, uh, next step therapies. I really think that either one of them would be appropriate, uh, particularly when you have to get a biologic approved, uh, although approving omelizumab these days with being on the market for a very long period of time uh, is not uh, too challenging. Um, so in, in terms of uh, overall management, um, we've kind of talked about this already. Um, Refractory urticaria and angioedema. This is kind of what I wanted to jump into, not to jump around too much, but we kind of reviewed this slide, similar, almost identical slide as to what I went over before. So I just want to jump into what happens when it gets refractory. You know, here's our patient. We're navigating through with a patient. What do we do? What stops can we pull out? Now, there are some drugs, and this is where a biopsy will come in helpful because there's neutrophil predominant urticaria. And there's, of course, it's eosinophil predominant urticaria. And there's sometimes cell poor predominant urticaria. And so which drugs do we choose? And drugs like colchicine and dapsone uh, are, are neutrophil reducers. And so therefore, they may be effective choices. But, you know, we have options like colchicine, sulfasalazine. I mentioned mycophenolate. Uh, methotrexate has been used. I don't use it that often. But serolimus, even anti-TNF inhibitors have been used in a variety of settings of refractory or urticarial angioedema. Um, stenozolol, uh, IVIG, not uncommonly utilized and, and 
quite helpful for individuals that really have severe chronic urticaria that is persistent, unrelenting. I've had some success in treating individuals with hydroxychloroquine in doses of two to 400 milligrams daily. Um, uh, omalizumab, we'll talk about, tacrolimus systemically, not used very often, also cyclosporin, uh, which is, is part of standard protocol for managing individuals uh, with recalcitrant urticaria. And so what about evaluating the utility of these or, or alternative type agents for refractory chronic urticaria? Um, so there are case series and case reports. Uh, they are smaller, they tend to be subject to bias, but nevertheless, when we get into trouble, it's at least nice to know that there have been those agents that have been studied in some randomized controlled clinical trials, including hydroxychloroquine, cyclosporine, and omalizumab. Um, so how do they work? Well, well here's hydroxychloroquine. It's a potent anti-inflammatory. Uh, this is a very small study, 21 patients with chronic urticaria angiotema. Remember, it's very hard with chronic urticaria, you know, getting these patients to be enrolled in the trial. So they're usually not very uh, big uh, clinical trials. And you'll see here from the urticaria spores and their medication response scores and their quality of life improvements, uh, clearly from a quality of life standpoint, uh, patients on hydroxychloroquine fared uh, quite nicely, uh, but from terms of the improvements of their urticaria scores, um, they, they were not statistically different compared to placebo when we look at uh, urticarial scores and uh, medication response type scores here. Uh, the, the individuals, again, as I stated, there was statistical significant difference uh, as, as we look here and we see these uh, differences uh, in quality of life. Um, very small separations uh, in terms of uh, those individuals uh, achieving an actual uh, clinical response. Again, uh, repetition is important. Um, even some just new stepwise therapy data and information. This is published a little bit more recently by Kaplan and colleagues. And just step one, we talked a lot about this. Uh, Non-sedative uh, second or third generation antihistamines are now by far and away more recommended, although I think many of us will still, particularly at nighttime, when patients have really severe pruritus, will utilize some of the originator antihistamines, uh, omalizumab in step two with 300 milligrams monthly, subcutaneous, we'll talk about that, and if no response after a couple of injections. Uh, we go into cyclosporin and some of the other agents that I just referenced. Now, there is some debate about uh, this, and there are some uh, studies that indicate and some protocols that uh, offer up the use of cyclosporin first. And you see this somewhat complicated flow chart referencing cyclosporin. And again, small numbers when you start to see this, but this is a study that was done. It's a cyclosporin trial for uh, a chronic urticaria that was done. Uh, these are individuals that were studied in dosing regimen about four milligram per kg for about four week period. And, and there's obviously uh, a lot of different arms here about who responded and who didn't respond. Again, a very small study. And I find that in my experience, we do have a fairly a significant number of non-responders, about 11 out of a total of N of 30, um, uh, but nevertheless, this drug is a potent anti-inflammatory and will help our patients uh, who have chronic spontaneous urticaria, particularly when they are recalcitrant uh, to uh, standard therapies. These are um, urticarial uh, activity scores and visual analog scores. And we see here that uh, compared to a uh, baseline placebo group, uh, a much smaller placebo group, again, these studies are very small, uh, we do see these numeric separations uh, between treatment groups. Uh, and uh, uh, vehicle, I'm sorry, placebo group in terms of response to cyclosporin. You know, it, it's unclear, particularly with new generations on the market, those that are hopefully coming to the market, as to whether the side effect panel uh, is desirable uh, in individuals who are suffering. Uh, I've had a pretty good experience with cyclosporin in terms of dosing overall. It's usually about uh, anywhere from 100 to 200 milligrams BID, so about 200 to 400 milligrams, 400 milligrams being my total maximum daily dose over time. Again, you're going to be in that three to five uh, milligram per kilogram uh, dosing range. Uh, in the context of some of the study limitations, potential harms and costs, um, using cyclosporin, if you look across the literature, we see this chronic urticaria update uh, uh, by Bernstein and colleagues going back a number of years ago. Um, there's not a lot of research that's going to be done in cyclosporin. Again, the numbers are very small, so use it with caution. There has been an open label study that was done quite a long time ago, tacrolimus, another, another uh, calcineurin inhibitor working very similarly to um, 
uh, cyclosporine, a uh, lot of side effects potentially, uh, but uh, some improvement of urticaria is noted. Uh, again, another very small study here, 19 patients, uh, urticarial spores at baseline, um, you know, zero to four range, um, a number of patients, there was a reasonable number of non-responders, there were a few responders, uh, again, this would be very last resort type therapy. Uh, we get into now the modern day drug that is approved for treating patients with uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria. Here's one of the uh, more recent uh, studies that was done, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is known as the uh, Steria trial, Steria trial 2. We see the protocol here. Uh, again, uh, this is... Um, the study designed for the Asteria 2, and we saw dosing ranges of uh, 75, 150, and 300 milligrams. And as you know, the drug is dosed um, uh, in the clinic somewhere around 150 or 300 milligrams uh, monthly. And, and I have a number of patients on omalizumab, and they've done quite well. So we see significant improvements that were uh, from the Asteria trial uh, in terms of the improvement of the uh, urticaria scores. Uh, we see the change in baseline, um, uh, uh, their itch severity responses. Um, as we see here, this is actually reporting out some of the itch responses, and there are statistically significant differences uh, that are seen in the 150 milligram and the 300 milligram treatment uh, dosing regimen in this dose ranging study. And so it clearly is dose dependent. And uh, as we see here, there were not statistically significant differences in the 75 milligram treatment group. Um, a little bit more recent data, we look at a significantly higher proportion of individuals that achieved improvement of their urticaria response scores. If you see in this uh, particular studies uh, left and right here, so this is the UAS7, the UAS7 um, uh, less than six, and the UAS7 less than zero. Uh, so these are urticaria measurement type scores. Um, one is a secondary endpoint from the clinical trial. One is a post hoc analysis. And so we see significantly higher proportion of patients in the omalizumab, both 150 milligram, 300 milligram treatment groups uh, having improvement in their symptoms overall. And, and then if we look at the uh, UAS, so this is the urticaria uh, improvement scores and this post hoc analysis, they actually looked at those individuals who had complete resolution of their itch and their urticaria. And we see these dramatically statistically significant differences between treatment group uh, and placebo, both in the 150 milligram and 300 milligram treatment group. Although I think it is clear that the 300 milligram treatment group uh, does perform much better. Um, so a, a 300 milligram a treatment group, uh, highly successful at all endpoints. Uh, interestingly enough, we, uh, we didn't really reference it specifically because I'm focusing primarily on urticaria, but these urticaria AS, these UAS scores are inclusive of those individuals which in the trial, they were allowed to enter with a background of angioedema. And so you see that the endpoints that were inclusive of angioedema were successful with the 300 milligram treatment group, but not so much with the 150 milligram treatment group. And so I think it's clear and recommended that you treat your patients with 300 milligrams of omalizumab uh, monthly. You know, the biggest issue with this drug uh, that we had known of uh, was anaphylaxis. Um, some GI upset, some headaches in some patients. Um, over time, this drug has been on the market so much that you now know that it can be uh, injected at home in self-injection. We have to warn our patients about the potential of anaphylaxis, but this is one of these times where post-marketing, uh, there has been so little uh, anaphylaxis that we know that it can be utilized uh, uh, in the house. And so many of our patients are now self-injecting. Uh, this is a study that was done, uh, omalizumab in patients with symptomatic chronic spontaneous urticaria, uh, uh, despite standard combination therapies. And so remember some of the studies that were done originally, those are individuals that have been previously mostly on monotherapy. Um, uh, we look again at the uh, study design as, as well here. We see uh, various primary endpoints here. Uh, just moving forward for you to be able to see the statistically significant differences between omalizumab and placebo. And this is a monotherapy trial with 300 milligrams. It's not a dose ranging study. Um, very nice comment from Bernstein and colleagues relative to the other biologic agents. The therapeutic utility of omalizumab has been sort of supported by findings from double-blind randomized controlled trials, and it's the preferred biologic agent for refractory chronic urticaria. 
So back to our patient, she comes back, um, you know, an additional 12 weeks later, she's been on omalizumab, she's doing well, her fatigue has gotten better as well. She has no angioedema, um, uh, her energy is up, as I stated. And so what do we do here? You know, she actually is still on her cetirizine, 40 milligrams. Remember, com combination therapy is very uh, popular and common and utilized. Um, uh, again, remember that was a monotherapy study that was done uh, previously that we just saw in the last couple of slides. And so it's challenging what to do here. There are various protocols, and I tell you, there may be very well be a difference in the clinical trenches. Um, sometimes it's very challenging to take patients off of these therapies. There are some remittative periods. And the question is, do we stop one drug? Do we stop all drugs because the patient's clear? Um, do we keep them on a maintenance? Do we stop omalizumab and keep the patient just on cetirizine? And, and, and these are very challenging questions from <clears throat> a clinical standpoint and also uh, a, a patient decision, shared decision-making tree. And, and I'm not so sure 100% that there is a correct answer here. That's not what's important. But we know from the data, and we know from when you stop omalizumab, um, you will get a period of remission when the patient reaches that urticaria improvement and that urtic urticaria and angioedema improvement score. You may elect to um, discontinue omalizumab accordingly. Uh, maintain the um, uh, second generation antihistamine, uh, as was done in this particular case. Um, uh, but nevertheless, um, it's really a shared decision making. Uh, I think in a period of time of 32 weeks, when you have an individual who's been suffering, like in this particular case, I think a continuum of therapy and monitoring to the patient until there is a significant period of remission in the neighborhood of six months, uh, that one starts to consider um, a potential or drug holidays. Uh, antihistamines are the mainstay of therapy for managing uh, patients with various forms of urticaria, including chronic urticaria. Uh, they're in fact effective in uh, about to 50% of the patients overall, so they're not perfect. We didn't really talk a lot about systemic corticosteroids. Uh, they are necessary for short periods of time to, so to speak, get the, the, the patients through, but nevertheless, they have their toxicities and, of course, chronic use. Uh, and in most allergic conditions, including atopic dermatitis, is not recommended. There's a number of therapeutic alternatives. We talk about the older generation uh, H1 uh, blockers. We talk about the new generation therapies and the second generation therapies as well. And, of course, those particular therapies uh, that are available for refractory uh, or to carry as well. Um, there's limited evidence, but nevertheless, when we get into trouble and we need these agents, we can certainly utilize them. And there is certainly data for omalizumab uh, supporting uh, its effectiveness uh, in the management of urticaria. Uh, in terms of algorithms, once again, um, try to eliminate triggers. Consider biopsies, particularly if you suspect urticarial vasculitis. And we really didn't talk about neutrophilic urticaria, but if you're thinking neutrophilic, do a biopsy, try to prove it. Always be worried about checking labs in general, making sure the patients are otherwise healthy in the background. There is an entity of neutrophilic urticaria known as Snitchler syndrome, where those patients may have a background uh, monoclonal gammopathy in the background, so be careful, but trials of dapsone or colchicine may work in that sense, that setting. A minimum 150 milligram omalizumab uh, used per month. If there's a partial response, then certainly escalate to 300 milligrams per month. It's my recommendation to start all patients, this is just Brad Glick speaking, at 300 milligrams monthly. Um, just to, to close, uh, there has been a number of reports and there are some trials ongoing for the use of dupilumab of, because of its impact on that uh, TH2 pathway down-regulating cytokines like interleukin-413 and interleukin-5, all those playing very important roles in conditions like urticaria. And so the verdict is out. There's been variable reports. There's a recent phase three trial that was done that uh, really the data was somewhat inconclusive um, and not necessarily supportive of this being effective therapy. I can tell you in my experience using 300 milligrams of dupilumab after a loading dose of 600 milligrams very much as we use in treating patients with atopic dermatitis has been quite helpful uh, in the management of patients with uh, chronic somewhat recalcitrant forms of urticaria. So to summarize, the clinical assessment of urticaria does require clear understanding of its subtypes and disease activity. And we need to really focus on potential triggers, particularly in acute urticaria. 
avoidance of underlying causes and potentiating factors like cold and heat, particularly for those physical urticarias, as important in terms of management and management protocols. We talked uh, about omalizumab and its utility in treating our patients with chronic spontaneous uh, urticaria. And we know as well that there are some agents that are available uh, and, and three that we talked about uh, that have been at least studied in randomized clinical trials uh, for managing patients with chronic, chronic spontaneous urticaria. And then finally, evidence-based recommendations for the management of chronic urticaria are important uh, components in terms of selecting your therapies. Although I would remind you that the the uh, studies were limited. The level of evidence for many of these studies is a low to moderate level of evidence, and the, the numbers of individual trials are small. So with that said, I thank you. I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, treating patients uh, with urticaria, and I hope that you enjoy this year's annual DEF meeting. Thank you.